we're going to talk about correlation. And this changes a little bit of the pattern we've been learning so far, but it is a very useful measure. And moving forward, you're going to find that when we connect it with regression, that we can gain a lot of useful information. So let's talk about what we've learned so far so we can kind of map it on. The first thing we learned was a one sample t. And remember, we looked at how one condition predicted some number outcome. Let's say it was my magic t, and I compared to that to some known average of IQ, so I could see how the people who consumed my magic t how their IQ might have changed. So when we were thinking about that, we looked at our magic T distribution and compared it to those who haven't had T or this normal IQ to see if there was um, any difference. So there was one condition, those who consumed my T. Then we looked at a one sample T, which also was one condition looking at a number outcome. Um, and the reason we had to move to a one sample t is because we used that when we didn't know the sigma or the standard deviation of the population. And so the one sample t was much more common than the one sample z, but pictorially it still represented this image here where we wanted to see how those who consumed my t differed from the normal population. Then we moved on to a dependent t, which was a paired condition situation. Maybe we looked at before and after consuming t my magic T, and we looked at their IQ scores. Now that picture still represents here because this is the different scores compared to the different scores of the normal population. Remember, a dependent T is very much like a one sample T just on the different scores. Then we moved on to an independent T, and this is where we had now two conditions and looking at how it predicted um, a number outcome. So maybe we looked at a placebo condition and those who consumed my magic T, and we compared those two just distributions together. Then we moved on to an ANOVA, which was three or more conditions predicting our number outcome. So perhaps we had placebo, my magic tea group, and then we had um, a magic coffee group, right? So now we have three distributions and looked at see how they differed on the number outcome. Now remember, an ANOVA can be three or more conditions. So what we've done so far has We've come up with every approach for every kind of um, scenario where we have a number outcome in different conditions. We had one condition, two conditions, or three or more conditions. So these tests have allowed us to look at when we've assigned people to groups, um, how they differ on their number outcomes. What we haven't done is look at how numbers predict numbers. So let's say I wanted to know um, how tall you are and how that predicts your income. Well, if I just let your height be the number that it naturally is going to be, I can see if that predicts your income without putting you into groups. Now I could put you into groups and say small, or sorry, short versus tall. But by chopping the numerical information in short versus tall, I've actually eliminated a lot of the useful data. So rather than put people into groups when we're doing a correlation, we're going to let the numbers vary as they naturally would to see how they predict other numbers. So that differs from what we've been doing so far, where we stuck people into groups and then compared their, dis their different distributions together. However, because we're no longer putting people into groups, we no longer have the ability to randomly assign them to groups. So I can't randomly assign you to my magic T anymore. I can't randomly assign you to height. And so that leads to a very important piece of correlation. So just like I used to have you remember that the null hypothesis is no difference, I also want you to take away that the correlation does not equal causation. This is something you will really want to have a mantra in your head. And it's so important that I have a whole separate video related to understanding that when we do a correlation, we have no idea what the causal forces are. Because I'm letting your height vary freely, I don't know if it if it's the reason why you have different income or if there's something else and I'm just measuring height as an indicator of that. So at the end of the day, correlations tell us very useful information about how variables are related, but it doesn't tell us what caused what to happen. And, the, and we're limited in that way. So make sure to check out that video so you can understand that correlations don't tell us anything about causality. They just tell us about how two variables are related that are numbers. So what we're going to do with a correlation is calculate a correlation coefficient. The word coefficient is just a fancy word for number. 
And that number is going to tell us three things about the relationship between X and Y. I think it's so cool that we have one number that tells us three things. They're going to tell us, it's going to tell us the direction of the relationship, the form of the relationship, and the degree, otherwise known as the strength. So this is kind of our to-do list for this particular lecture. We're going to talk about what each of these things mean. And um, it's important to realize, though, that each of those three things are important to understanding how our two variables are related. We're going to be using Pearson's R. There are other correlation coefficients that we could calculate, but Pearson's R is the most commonly used one and it will work for many of our needs. So I will point out when the Pearson's R won't work. However, moving forward in this particular class, especially at the introductory level, Pearson's R correlation is going to be exactly what we need. So let's first talk about the direction of the relationship. So this is a scatter plot of data and you can see that um, the data points kind of cluster from starting in the lower left and moving to the upper right. And now if you were to try to envision what the slope would be, now there's no wrong answer because there's no numbers here, but the slope would be something like over one, up one, over one, up one, right? And so you can see that this is a sloping upward uh, set of data. And if we calculate the correlation coefficient, I haven't taught you how to do it yet, but if we calculate it, the number would actually come out positive. So when the number comes out positive, it tells us that this is the way the data look. And so what we can see is that the data are moving in the same direction. Let's do an example, let's say father's height and son's height. As dads get taller, sons get taller. Tall dads have tall sons. Short dads have short sons. Let's say this is um, how many hours you have studied and test score, right? Lots of hours studying is associated with higher test score. Lower hours of studying is lower test score. Now again, I wanna point out, I'm not saying that studying makes you do better on the test. I'm just saying they're related in that way. Let's say that if you really like stats, you like to study a long time. And if you really like stats, you tend to do better on the test because you like it. It may not have anything to do with hours studied, but it is important as a statistician for me to know that if I'd like to know your test score, it's helpful for me to know how many hours you studied because it will help me predict your actual test score. So these are moving up together. Now, sometimes I have students erroneously think if, if I ask them about a positive correlation, they'll say, oh, they're both high, high study hours, high test score. And they forget to recognize that they could both be low, low study hours and low test scores. So I wanna really highlight the fact that these are moving in the same direction. So low scores, low hours, high scores, high hours. Let's compare that to a negative correlation. So if we calculate our correlation, we will get a negative value for data that look like this. And you can see here that the data start up in the upper left and move down to the lower right. And so if I were to try to think of what the slope would look like, it'd be over one, down one, over one, down one. So that down is what gives me an indication of the negative calculation. And so what I want to point out here is that these data are moving in opposite directions. So let's say this is a face-to-face -face class. It's absences down here and test scores here. More absences tends to predict lower test scores. So here's somebody who has a lot of absences and they have a low test score. Or here's someone who has very few absences and they have a high test score. Now I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that absences cause you to have um, a lower test score. It may be that if you have a lot of absences, it's because you're sick and that illness is preventing you from being able to think about stats, but it is a predictor. The absences does predict test scores. So that is very useful. Oops, I don't know why that moved forward without me. Uh, another one, let's say um, this is the number of complaints you have at your job and the tips that you get, right? Now, I'm not saying that um, if you have more complaints, it's causing you to have less tips. There may be that um, because you're not getting tips, you, you do things that make people complain about you, right? That would be fair. But it is useful to know that if someone has fewer complaints, they tend to get more tips. If they have a lot of complaints, they ha tend to have fewer tips. So I don't know causality, but I do know the nature of the relationship or the direction of the relationship, and they move in opposite 
directions. That's in contrast to a positive correlation where they move in the same. They go low together or they go up together. Whereas a negative relationship, they are opposite, low and high, high and low. I also wanted to point out what it would look like if there was no correlation. So if we were to calculate the correlation here, it would be zero. And you see that there's really no pattern of the dots. It's just a random smattering of dots. Maybe you could say something like um, eyelash length and IQ scores. Those two things are not related. And so what we would see then if we were to try to map a line to this, it would just be flat because there's no pattern there. There's no useful knowledge in knowing your eyelash length if I were to try to predict your IQ score. And so I just wanted you to look and see that this one doesn't have an upward pattern or a downward pattern. It really has no pattern. So that was direction of the relationship. Now let's talk about form. Form is actually the easiest one moving forward because I'm going to tell you the Pearson's R correlation assumes that we are all going to have linear straight line relationships. So if you find that something doesn't follow a straight line, we can't calculate that correlation in this class. You'd have to go on and take an advanced stats class. Um, I do want to make <clears throat> take pause and recognize that not all relationships are linear or follow a straight line. And that's why it's important to pause and look at your data to see whether a Pearson's R is um, justified. So let me just give you an example of that. Um, and But again, I do wanna point out that in our class, if we look at the data and it seems to follow a straight line, then we are just gonna use Pearson's R and the form has been established. Let's say that we're looking at data and we wanna see how fear arousing messages um, relate to behavior change. And so, you know, something like trying to get people to stop taking drugs. And so you might um, do some commercial that scares them and says, don't take drugs because of this and see if it induces behavior change. And if we look at the reality of what data say, they, they suggest a pattern like this, where low fear induces low, little behavior change, but increasing the fear amounts does induce behavior change. This example would be something like those old commercials <clears throat> where they used to say, this is your brain and it looks like an egg and they crack it on a pan and they say, this is your brain on drugs. Uh, research found that that was very low inducing of fear. People didn't really, they kind of laughed at it. They didn't, they weren't really scared. So it didn't really induce a lot of behavior change. But then as you do, oops, increasing amounts of fear, you did see more behavior change. I don't know if you've seen the commercials where they have people who have smoked and, you know, they are breathing, uh, talking through a device and I've smoked for 20 years and, you know, or they've lost parts of their, you know, a jaw or thing from smoking. That's very scary. And they actually found that as people see those commercials that have induced more fear by relating it to something real, that it does induce more behavior change. So when we look at this data set, it does look as though there's an increasing relationship between fear, or sorry, the level of fear and the behavior change. But we also know with research that if you keep going, there's a different pattern. And so what we found is that if you keep inducing more and more and more fear, you actually kind of uh, counteract the benefit. And so, for example, if you've ever seen um, people advocating to um, outlaw abortions. And regardless of your stance on abortion, um, you may recognize there are people who stand on the street with big, gigantic posters of aborted fetuses. And their attempt is to increase your arousal or your fear so that you will change your behavior in thinking that abortion is okay. But what happens is when people see that image, they tend to look away because it's very um, unnerving. Regardless of how you feel about it, people tend to look away. And because it's so fear inducing, people tune it out. They actually don't behave. They don't change their behavior. So there's an optimal level of, be of fear arousal that leads to behavior change. And then once you pass that optimal level, then the change starts to go down. Now, if we saw all of our dots in our um, scatter plot follow a line like this, if we were to plot a Pearson's R correlation, it would look like there's no relationship. But in fact, there really is a relationship between fear arousing messages and behavior change. So this would be a case where Pearson's R would not be the appropriate test to run. Um, however, in, for us, if we look and it seems like they're following a straight line, then Pearson's R is going to work perfectly.
So the last piece, and it's probably the most important piece, is the strength of the relationship. And um, I also called it the degree of the relationship. This is really how good is your X variable in predicting your Y variable. So for example, if I'm trying to predict your test score, which do you think is a better predictor of your test score? Um, how many hours you studied versus uh, how many cups of coffee you drank? Now they mo both might predict your test score, but I think hours of study is a better predictor of what your grade's gonna be than how many cups of coffee you drink. And so this strength of the relationship is going to indicate to me how good the variable is at predicting your outcome. And so what we're going to see is that when we calculate our correlation, it can only range from negative 1 to 1. So scores do not go past 1 or past negative 1. But the positiveness and negativeness of that, remember, that wasn't an indicator of strength. That was an indicator of the nature of the relationship, whether it was moving upward or downward. So we really have to ignore whether it's a positive and negative number. We really just want to look at the value itself. So the bottom line is, if it's near zero, that means there's really nothing going on. There's no relationship. As it moves away from zero, the relationship is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. The maximum strength it could have would be one or negative one. Because remember, the negative doesn't matter here. And so if it's a 0.9, that's a very strong relationship. If it's a 0.3, that's a very weak relationship. And so what we will have to do as statisticians is decide at what point the relationship has crossed over into being a significant predictor. We are going to use the p-value to determine that, but I do want to tell you that if it gets around 0.7 or negative 0.7, because again that's the same kind of strength, if it's a 0.7 or further out, that is really a significant um, correlation. Under 0.7, it starts to get a little iffy. So we're looking for correlations of 0.7 and higher to really indicate to us that it's significant, although we will use our p-value to really tell us how, if it's significant or not. But I do want to highlight that any values close to zero are weak. The further you get from zero, either out on the negative side or the positive side, that means the stronger the relationship. So we're really going to use those numbers to tell us how strong the relationship is. We're going to use the positive and negative to tell us whether it's moving in an upward direction or a downward direction. And then since we're using Pearson's R, we'll know that these are for a straight line. So here's some examples. Here's a correlation that is a 0.05, which is very close to zero, right? And you can see there's no pattern in the data. They're not moving up or down, really. Um, and the calculation really does reflect that. Versus this, this is nearly perfect. It's as close to one as we'll probably ever see. Enjoy that now because you'll probably never see it again. In social sciences, people are just too variable. They don't ever really fall on a straight line. But do you see how useful it would be to know your X value if I wanted to predict your Y value? Because let's say this is your X score. It pretty much tells me what your Y score is going to be. So that's a lot of predictive utility. Um, if I only know your X, I can pretty accurately predict your Y if you have a correlation as strong as 0.99. In this particular case, it's positive, but even if it were negative, a 0.99 would also be very useful. Now look at these down here. These are 0.7s, and you can see how the dots are wider and um, not clustered together as tightly as the 0.99, but there's still some predictive utility. Let's say your X score is in here. I know that your Y score is gonna be roughly in this range because that's where the dots are. And so this is telling me that there is some predictive utility in knowing your X score if I wanna predict your Y score. Now this is moving in a positive direction, so that's a positive 0.7. This one's moving in a negative direction, That's a so it's a negative 0.7, but I want to point out that these bottom two graphs are equally strong because they're both at a 0.7, they have equal strength, it's just that this one's moving up and this one's moving down. Now on a test question, I could never ask you which one of these is 0.7 and which one of these is 0.6. That would be really hard to determine, but I could have asked you if I showed you these set of four, which one's a negative 0.7, because there's only one in here that's negative, so you would have been able to identify that. You might have also been able to identify one that's nearly perfect or one that has hardly any correlation at all. Um, but I just wanted you to visualize what these correlations would look like. And really what the strength of a correlation is indicating to you is how tightly packed are these dots. 
when they're very tightly packed, it's a stronger correlation. The looser the dots are, the weaker the correlation gets. I do want to show you the formula, but don't be intimidated because we are going to have JASP calculate it for us. But in essence, what the calculation is doing is looking at the degree to which the two variables vary together divided by how much they vary separately. So how variables vary together, we call that covariance. So we're going to have a calculation of how much X and Y move together divided by their independent variability. Now remember, you know what the standard deviation of X is and standard deviation of Y. That's their independent variability. So this is how much they move together divided by how much they move independently. So our covariance is calcula calculated like this, and I just want to show you that it's still this essence of taking each score and subtracting it from the mean, but we're looking at how they move together. So the overall correlation calculation looks something like this. And again, it's the idea of covariance of X and Y divided by the independent variability of X and the independent variability of Y. But this is where we have to love JASP. As long as we have our raw data set up appropriately, JASP will go ahead and calculate that R correlation for us. And it'll tell us if it's positive, if it's negative, and then the strength of the relationship.